uh, talk about some of the decisions that have been made, how we got to where we are today, uh, some of the effects of the project, and, and some of the characteristics. In terms of uh, why we're looking at this project, um, you know, I think this, uh, this slide here really kind of summarizes uh, what many of you uh, face every day, or twice every day, uh, very congested roadway system. You know, if you're driving your own car, you're caught in this traffic. If you choose to uh, take the bus, uh, you're on a bus which is caught in this traffic. Um, and so we, we're looking at a uh, very much a lack of mobility, particularly uh, from west to west of town. Uh, that's today's situation. Um, the expectation is over the next uh, 25 years, uh, there's going to be more growth, about 200,000 more residents. Mostly the children, grandchildren, great grandchildren, the people that are here today. About 100,000 more jobs, and about uh, on an average weekday, about three quarters of a million more trips made. Um, the city and the state have jointly looked at uh, means of accommodating uh, this growth and, and ameliorating some of the uh, uh, congestion that occurs today, uh, and developed a regional transportation plan for 2030 under the auspices of the Long Island Public Planning Organization. They identified a, a series of projects that uh, are fundable that can be developed over this uh, time period, uh, including a significant amount of highway expansion. About $3 billion worth of highway projects are, are planned by the city and state uh, over this time period. Uh, certainly some improvements, traffic engineering improvements on the existing system. Um, ways to make it easier for you to walk or take a bike to, to get around without having to, to drive. Um, the boat, which has, you know, in the last couple of years been implemented as a uh, pilot project. Uh, hopefully we'll continue to serve and provide a good service from west of Auburn into town. Uh, ex expansion of the bus, uh, particularly as new uh, areas are developed and New residential areas are open, and then the, the plan identified the fixed guideway project is providing kind of a backbone for uh, transit service um, from Cobble A uh, into town. Uh, the, the rail transit route is shown here, um, and in, in purple here is the, the project that we're looking to build uh, beginning late next year. Uh, from East Coppola, following Farrington Highway, Hamail Highway, Salt Lake Boulevard, Billingham Boulevard, uh, into town, and the Alamoana Center. Um, the plan then would be for the, the next piece to be built would be uh, a spur to the airport, and then ultimately extensions uh, further west of Coppola, uh, completing the loop to serve Pearl Harbor and the airport, and extensions to Monroe and Waikiki. Um, in terms of the, the cost of the project, of the, the 20 mile project from East Top Lake to Alabama Center, um, what we show here is, is both in 2006 dollars, which is what we made the estimate in at the time of the alternatives analysis, and then inflated dollars, or so-called year of expenditure dollars, uh, recognizing that there's going to continue to be an increase in cost over the, the next, presumably uh, forever, but certainly over the time period that this project is going to be built. So we're looking at an estimated construction cost in inflated dollars of about $2.4 billion. Uh, this is to build the guideway structure, to build the stations, uh, to make, <coughs> excuse me, uh, roadway improvements, uh, relocate utilities, uh, essentially heavy construction, uh, not unlike what you do with the roadways. Uh, we have a, about a 26% contingency on top of that, uh, recognizing that this stage of the project, we don't, uh, we don't know everything there is to know about what we're going to be building, and so there may be some increases. And then we budgeted for right-of-way uh, for the rail vehicles, uh, for professional services, both for design, construction management, uh, oversight. And then on top of that, we have the project reserve. So this uh, total capital cost in the inflated dollars is about $4.6 uh, And then we're going to need to borrow some money 
particularly in the latter part of the project, uh, adding up to another 400 million. The total cost of about five billion dollars, over 30 dollars. Yeah, how will we pay for it? Well, you know, these, these are members that are actually from the alternatives analysis, but they're still, they're still very relevant. Uh, from, from the start, we recognized that uh, the two primary funding sources, the GDP surcharge and uh, New Start's funds from the federal government through the Federal Defense Administration, uh, that we didn't know exactly how much we were going to get, either in terms of the GDP or the New Start's funds. Uh, so we looked at a financial plan, looked at a range of, of revenues, GDP revenues in 2006 dollars from 2.6 to 3.2 billion, and inflated dollars from about three and a half to over four billion. <clears throat> Frankly, at the time we were doing the alternatives analysis uh, back in 2005, 2006, uh, we, we expected the GDP surcharges would probably come in towards the, the upper side of that range. Um, more recently, and as you probably know, um, GDP surcharge revenues have, have been coming in more slowly as the economy has slowed down. Um, but even you know under under these uh, more difficult times, we still feel that we're within the range that we identified in the financial. On the, the federal side, we also identified a, a range of dollars, an inflated dollars from about 700 million to 1.2 billion. Um, and we continue to have discussions with the Federal Council Administration, uh, with members of Congress, both from the Hawaii delegation and, and other congressional leaders. And we continue to, to uh, uh, be told that this is a, a very reasonable assumption of the amount of federal funds that we can get for a project like this, assuming that we meet the, uh, the federal criteria for cost effectiveness. And as it stands right now, our project looks uh, very viable in that regard. It's, it's going to be a very cost effective project. Um, sort of balancing the budget, as I said, we're looking at revenue of about roughly $5 billion, $4 billion or so from GDP, roughly a billion from federal and our cost comes out the same. About 4.6 billion for the capital cost and about 400 million in interest costs to borrow. The other side of the equation in, in building a project like this is the continuing cost to operate and maintain. Um, we, we estimate that the operating and maintenance cost for the rail system after fares will be about 40 to maybe 45 million a year. Uh, that's about a third of the cost of the bus, and is an addition of about two or maybe almost three percent of the city's annual operating budget. So we're really looking at a relatively small increase in the amount of city funds that go to uh, operate the transit system. Uh, it may well be possible that that can be accommodated within the budget. Uh, there's that much variation just kind of year, year to year in the budget. Also importantly, uh, we're, we're definitely convinced that a bus, bus rail system, uh, it's actually supposed to say costs less than the cost less, costs less than the cost of carrying the same number of riders on a bus only system. Um, on a per passenger mile, the cost of carrying a passenger for a mile, uh, rail is about a third less expensive than operating a bus. Uh, so how did we get to where we are? There have been a series of decisions made. Uh, the City Council made a choice of mode, choosing fixed guideway and exclusive right of way. The choice of alignment, uh, looking ultimately going from Coppola to Mono and Waikiki, initially from East Coppola to Alamoana Center. As I mentioned, the airport spur is the desired next phase of the project. And a uh, uh, selection panel identified steel wheel and steel rail as the preferred choice for the um, The choice of fixed guideway was made by the City Council on December 22, 2006. Uh, by a 7 2 vote, the Council chose uh, fixed guideway as, as the mode of choice. Um, that came out of the results of the alternatives analysis that we prepared and delivered to Council in November of 2006. It looked at four general alternatives. 
a new build, which essentially said no significant improvements in the transit system, a alternative that was labeled transportation system management, which essentially meant uh, doing the best you can do without major capital expenditures, so it was expanding the bus system, looked at a managed lane alternative, actually a couple options of a managed lane alternative. From the transit perspective, that would be running buses on a, on a viaduct, on a guideway, um, which would also be open to other vehicles being towed. And finally, the fixed guideway alternative. As I mentioned, the City Council, by its 72 vote, chose the fixed guideway alternative. Uh, you know, one of the options would have been an expanded bus service. The alternatives analysis, I think, identified some reasons why that was not a good choice. Uh, traffic congestion slows buses, increases operating costs. As I mentioned already, uh, the other cost to carry a passenger in a bus is about a third more than in rail. And as traffic slows down and buses slow down, and that difference can become even greater. Um, certainly the bus today is seeing an increase in, or a decrease in average operating speed year to year. Uh, traffic congestion, uh, operating buses in traffic, as I showed in that early slide, hurt schedule reliability. Uh, today only about uh, two-thirds of the bus runs in a day are on schedule, which is to say a third of the bus trips are behind schedule. And in certain key locations, the bus system is approaching capacity. Uh, certainly, in terms of just fitting people on buses, uh, there are 20 or 30 times on an average day that buses have to pass by uh, people waiting at the bus stop because there's no more room on the bus. And there are also some locations in the system, such as at uh, King, Lehigh, and Dillingham, where uh, simply the number of buses trying to go through the intersection at in an hour is approaching the capacity of how many buses you can fit through an intersection. Um, we also, in terms of the managed lane alternative, look at an option of buses on toll lanes. Um, and the alternatives analysis also identified that as, a, as having problems. Um, our analysis indicated that adding uh, additional capacity for uh, vehicles would result in an increase in traffic. And while the uh, vehicles on the facility itself would be relatively free-flowing, uh, there would be an overall increase of congestion in the backups at, at the ends of the facility. I frankly didn't do a whole lot for transit usage in terms of our analysis. And, and certainly the managed lane alternative we looked at in the alternatives analysis was not financially feasible. Uh, neither federal transit funds nor the GET surcharge revenues would be eligible to pay for that project. Uh, certainly, having toll lanes adds to the cost of travel for those people that want to use the facility. Uh, looking at uh, a peak period toll that could be on the order of six to ten dollars uh, one way. Um, you can pay that twice a day, five days a week, and add up a lot of cost. And then, the bottom line, it uh, essentially just encourages the use of more vehicles running on the port of oil. Um, in terms of the technology analysis, um, the, the selection panel uh, identified steel on steel as, as the most common, most reliable choice. Uh, certainly the experience of FTA indicates that uh, the vast majority of projects they've funded with uh, New Start's funds uh, have been steel, wheel on steel rail transfer measures. And there's certainly a large number of rail systems uh, throughout North America uh, in cities large and small. In terms of some of the effects of the project, uh, certainly one effect is going to be uh, jobs related to constructing the project. Uh, in terms of direct employment, we're looking at about 4,700 construction jobs per year uh, over about an eight-year uh, time period of, of construction. That adds up to about 38,000 person years of employment. Um, when you add in the indirect employment resulting from that economic activity, uh, we're looking at a total of about 11,000 jobs per year uh, that will be attributable to the construction of this project. Uh, certainly in terms of the effect on mobility, uh, we're looking at a system capacity with a, uh, a system with one track in each direction, uh, about uh, 26 to 28 feet wide, 
as the equivalent capacity in terms of, of people carrying capacity to about six freeway lanes of cars. Um, by having a facility that would be uh, fully grade separated in its own right of way, uh, we'd have reliable travel times. Uh, the train would take the same time to go from one end to the other uh, every day, every hour of the day, uh, not affected by uh, congestion or accidents on the, on the roadway system down below. Uh, it certainly helps provide mobility to those that don't drive, uh, which is an increasing number of folks, both young and old. And our analysis indicated that it would reduce future traffic congestion by about 11%. In terms of effects on the environment, um, compared to the other alternatives that would require less energy use, uh, fewer emissions, and then finally, you know, our analysis, and this was confirmed by the information we received during the, the technology uh, selection process, that rail vehicles are quieter than buses. Uh, the project also gives the opportunity for transit oriented development, which uh, the city, through the Department of Planning and Permitting, is actively uh, pursuing a, an initial uh, project uh, at the two stations in Waipahu. Uh, these are to develop uh, livable, walkable communities, taking advantage of transit access, uh, giving people the opportunity to, to live in a, a community where uh, they may not need as many cars as they would if they were living elsewhere. It's a community-based planning process. Uh, the intent is to uh, allow for the kinds of improvements, the kinds of new projects in the community that the, the residents want. And it's really intended to be primarily private investment. Uh, the public, uh, the city would help enable it uh, by changes in uh, land use ordinance and, and zoning, uh, but it would be private dollars that we would see uh, implementing transit development. And there certainly are many examples from around the country of, of sizable investment uh, in new projects around uh, real estate issues. In terms of some of the characteristics of the project, um, you know, these are certainly all in the boards around the room. Uh, we're looking at a system that would run 20 hours a day uh, with a service about every three minutes in the peak hour, about every six minutes during the midday, and 10 minutes in the evening. Um, a top speed of 55 to 60 miles an hour uh, between stations, an average including station stops at 30 miles an hour. You know, and I think it's also important to remember, as I mentioned before, that this is a very reliable travel shown on some of the boards around here, we're looking at integrating uh, with the bus system, uh, also some bicycle and walking paths, and all combined at stations, particularly in the of And we're looking at an integrated fare system with the bus and the uh, so that some of the fare will allow you to, to use it in the bus system. Some of the physical characteristics uh, we're looking, as I mentioned, I think we have some shots here that show uh, the elevated driveway with cars and existing roadway meetings. Uh, we see one track in each direction that the would be on some of the Looking at a driveway that would be less than 30 feet wide, probably about 26 to 28 feet. Uh, and of course, the stations that were widened out for the, for the passenger platforms. Looking at uh, 19 stations over the 20 miles of the line. The stations themselves would be about 250 to 300 feet long. Uh, these are just some examples of the kinds of systems we're looking at from other parts of the world. Uh, kind of the same general size of car and the type of structure that we think would make sense of the In terms of our project schedule, uh, we're right now in the midst of the environmental review process. Uh, we're working closely with the Federal Transit Administration relating to the release environment and environmental impact statement. Hopefully we're going to stop the base. Uh, we're also about to begin the preliminary engineering phase of the project. And then uh, towards the end of next year, we hope to uh, begin uh, award a contract for design, build, construction of an initial segment of the project, uh, which would be completed by 2012, 
I know this is your question. Do you mean when does the public get to comment on the EIS? This is Lawrence Spurgeon. It's a very good question, and I wish I knew the exact answer tonight. Um, we have prepared a draft environmental impact statement that's on the FPA. Uh, they have reviewed it and had several questions on it. Um, we've addressed the majority of the questions that they've had, uh, but they have not yet signed it and released the document. And until FTA makes the decision that, that the document represents every, you know, clearly and completely represents all of their position, um, they won't sign that document. Um, it, I mean, they, they could easily sign the document within the next week or within the next month, depending on um, how long it takes them to re-review and uh, and look at some of the items. Uh, as soon as the EIS is released, which could be as, as early as the end of this month or uh, in the next month, there will be a 45-day public comment period. Um, we will take all comments on the EIS and um, we'll then take those in and review those comments and prepare a final impact, environmental impact statement that reflects um, additional questions or additional issues that are brought up to the public process. And we'll have that final uh, impact statement um, next year. And there will be public hearings. Um, we will take comments in writing and, and through public hearings. And we will expect, or we're expecting right now, to have several public hearings um, throughout the uh, throughout the, the corridor. Well, the one of the things you actually live along the transit corridor. We plan a mailing you with a postcard that says that the DEIS is coming. We're going to do a lot of publicity for the public hearings so that you'll know when they are. Um, I would like to encourage you also, if you're interested in learning about the DEIS, if you sign up for our newsletter, either you get it electronically or uh, via the mail, then we'll be sure to give you Apple notification of when you can not only come to the public hearings, but how you might be able to get a copy of the DEIS uh, in an effort to be sort of environmentally friendly. I think what we're going to do is copy it to a CD so that we don't have to reproduce all that paper. And we're also working on a little video kind of DVD uh, distilled version for people as well. Our next question, and I'm going to, um, this next question is, why is it cheaper to maintain the steel on steel system rather than rubber tire on concrete. And I just want to spell this out because I want to give ample, uh, ample courtesy to the person who wrote this question. And this person spells steel on steel, S-T-A-L on S-T-A-L. A very simple answer is that uh, the, the rubber tires on concrete, uh, I'm Jim Banks, the project manager for Carson Spring and, and the very simple uh, answer is that uh, the, the rubber tires on the concrete tend to wear out a lot faster than the steel does. So you're constantly in the mode of having to take trains out of service, replace those, and put them back into service. Now that'll be a, that'd be a, that'd be a a maintenance program, obviously, for maintaining it, but I think it's pretty easy to understand that the concrete wear rubber will cause those tires to wear out simply, and therefore you have to pull them a little faster, and therefore we'll have to take those tires out of the service faster. Do you have anything else? I, th I think that's the, really the major component for uh, why it's more expensive. Next question is actually a series of questions, so we'll start with the first one. Since the project should end at UH, if the project moves a bit closer to Guantanamo, would it be possible to take the rail to UH? So I guess the, the, the person wants to know if we started a little bit further east, could we go a little bit further into town? I may even ask for some help with some of the city council folks on that. Um, in um, February of uh, 2007, um, the the council looked at a a large number of different uh, 
combinations are both termini, or starting and ending points of the project uh, that could fit within the funding that was available, um, including um, several that made it as far as, as UH. Um, actually, I'm not sure that we could start in my pocket. We, I mean, we probably had to start closer to, uh, to Pearl Highlands to, to fit that in the budget. Um, but ultimately, the council uh, chose to uh, look at an alignment that went from East Poplar to Moana Center as, as what they felt was the best choice, the best use of the, the monies that were available. Um, you know, I'm, I guess from my perspective, I think they felt that it was important to, to get the project um, out into Ava, uh, you know, beyond my problem to serve the areas where uh, there is future growth plan. Uh, certainly at that time we expected that the UH West campus would be under construction probably by the time we were uh, constructing the rail. Uh, so we thought it was, I think they felt it was important to, to get as far um, far west as, as was feasible. Um, we also, in terms of looking at the at the different alternatives, we, we had to go through various calculations of of their cost and benefits or cost effectiveness uh, to identify projects that would be eligible for uh, federal funding. You have to meet a, a certain cost effectiveness threshold, um, and we found that the um, alternative that we came up with going from East Copley to Alamoana was was one third cost effective. Um, and the ones that went further east, uh, getting to, to the UH, uh, were problematic, uh, partially because they didn't go as far west because we couldn't afford to, to, to do the entire one. stations 
on in all parts around the stations. And so we would promote less redevelopment around the stations in, in that location. But it just became overall that having one line that follows uh, the, the highways and follows the major roadways uh, is a lot less pro problematic to be able to, to get into town. I miss you.
if I want to go to a town quicker, I will transfer at White Parkway, Leo Cruz Street, get up Leo Cruz Street. Now, I think I would rather transfer to that rail transit, which will go probably to go downtown faster. Uh, you don't expect rail transit to come on Fort Beaver Road, but I, I suspect that previous speakers are ignorant of that plenty of people in Ever Beach ride the bus every morning because they work downtown Waikiki. In fact, the bus service from Ever Beach to Honolulu is more convenient than from where my mother lived, which is from Haina Haina. Because so many people have bought homes in Igor Oahu and many of them don't want to pay the high cost of parking to downtown. First, we have to transfer to another bus, but wouldn't we would rather than transfer to something that goes faster than a second bus? Okay, we're going to go back, we're going to, go back to questions. Um, and I'm going to need a little, I think I know what this person is asking, but I'm going to read the question and then we're going to try to answer it. And if this is your question and we're not getting it quite right, please pop up and let us know. The question is, the GBT estimates assume collecting money in the year they are collected. I think I don't know how to get the projects, The project estimates show has spent $4,980,000,000. Decrease the GBT estimates using the multiply the GET taxes twice. So I'm assuming this is a question. Sir. That, that's my question. I'm sorry I butchered it. I didn't really, I couldn't explain it. What your slide show. If you would, just for the audience, come up here and say so. Everybody can hear what you're saying. Thank you.
we looked at the question of if we started doing something well, how far west can we get? And when you factor in the cost of the project, along with the ridership and benefits ratio that was discussed earlier, again, we couldn't really even, I, don't, I think it came up just short of Pearl Highlands. The issue that that caused is one, we heard the issue of whether or not this serves that way. I believe it does, but if it's starting in the Pearl Highlands, the question is going to be, does that really serve the growing West Milwaukee community? The other mechanical problem is that the base yard for this system is either going to be next to LCC, just, I guess, west of LCC, or if we can't get the land there, which is currently owned by the federal government, we're going to DHHL, but we're, we're working out a deal to get there. It would end up being west of Fort Weaver Road. And if your base yard is there, your train system has to reach that base yard, otherwise the base yard is useless and you have no system. So that was the other factor of really requiring us to be able to take the system into the area where the base yard would potentially be. I think the other benefit that I looked at as, as we're going through that discussion is, assuming we go from UH West Oahu to Al Moana, and assuming that we have a successful system and we're looking to expand, there's going to be people from all sides of the island fighting for that expansion. The people in East Oahu are going to be fighting for it to continue from Al Moana to UH Manoa. West Oahu is going to be working to continue it from the UH West Oahu campus into the city of Kapolei. And then it's not going to become an East Oahu versus West Oahu issue down the road. It's going to be something that we as an entire island believe we have a successful system that we're looking to jointly work on, on expanding. So I think that's an additional benefit that came out of that. Um, so I've taken a bunch of time, but that was my reaction to some of the earlier things that were coming to I'm going to leave that to the moderator. Glad to answer. Okay. How, how, how could it come back to you? I just want to know, is there anybody out there who hasn't asked a question yet who would like to ask a question now? Because I want to be sure. Okay, this this woman right here. The PLA is a project labor agreement form. Okay, PLA, if it's a government type of job, like it is, a PLA form is supposed to have been signed regardless if you get federal aids. And what that does is that they keep non-union people out of the project. So my question is, why the PLA, PLA form was not signed? And what, because I feel as a union person, you know, what's going to happen to our union workers here in Hawaii? Because right now there's a shield over the constructions, there's a shield over all these members, all these members' eyes that you guys are putting on. Once this thing kick in, they're not going to have a job. We got to protect our local union here. So don't give no hunky dory kind of answers or whatsoever because we have educated people in this room. You know, you're not the only educated one. Thank you. Ma'am, I would, uh, I understand there's an awful lot of emotion on this one topic. And I think the answer that was given earlier was correct. As Mark said, when the current administration came in, one of the very first executive orders that the president signed which changed things from the previous administration was to do away with project labor agreements. Whether it's popular or not, or, or whatever, it, it, it is a fact that right now, if you're to get federal funds under this administration, project labor agreements are prohibited. Now, it, it could be that, as Mark said, that the next administration would change that. And obviously, it sounds like it's something that is subject to change. It definitely is. And that's what happened in, uh, in early 2001. You may not like it, but it, but it is the fact as it stands right now. So, my question is, are you telling me that our local labor union here will not, no. will not be able to get the job? No. Nobody knows, right? So my time for giving you money went to something, moving, and we can guarantee that our local people here are going to get the job. What I can tell you is we, earlier this year, <clears throat> and you guys can correct me if I have the date wrong, there was a big workshop where 
companies from small companies, big companies, local mailing companies came. And there was a, a commitment made that everyone looked, needs to look at ways to work in partnership so that many of these jobs can stay here. With a question. Uh, you, the, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry, but the thing is, my question was not. You gotta come up here and use the mic. People can't hear you. Renee, is his question your question, or you have a different question? Okay. Basically, the, the question, I, my name is Jim Ward. Um, basically, my question was just a question of, of basic fairness. Now, the thing is that. The, part of the thing that all the steps were gone through except the last step. The last step was that the city council voted eight to zero because they felt like that they would like to know if the community wants steel on steel. The only thing is that all along the alternatives to steel on steel have been blocked. And they're being blocked here tonight again. Because this in effect is part of a continuing sales job for steel on steel without being able to look. And, and the thing is that this is being paid for with tax, our taxpayer money is being used to do a sales job on us. We really don't have a choice. We are going to get steel on steel unless we vote otherwise. And it's a matter of fairness and that's why the full council Voted. So the stuff before about the experts, they uh, they superseded that, and and that should have been made clear. Thank you. I just want to be sure that everybody. That there's a gentleman back here who hasn't had a chance to speak yet, and I want to give him a chance. And I think that there's okay, yeah, because you were up. Just to respond. Mr. Brewer's comments. You gotta remember this process has been a long one. Um, I've sat through years of very long hearings, not only about various technology options, various route options, should we do this project or not. So I, I don't think it's fair to say that the other options have not been given a chance. Again, if those of you that recall, back in 2005, there was a call and it went out to the public, it was at public meetings, and said, anyone that has any ideas for what this system should be, turn them in. Here's the deadline, because all of those are going to be considered. After that, the project team took all of everything that came in, and yes, they distilled it. They made an analysis about which ones were going to be studied in the original uh, alternative analysis study, and that was done. And after that, we went through another year and a half of discussions about the alternative analysis study, what the other options were for technologies. We ultimately created an expert panel to make that decision. So it's not like the decision to do steel on steel came out of the blue and in a month and we're, we're pushing that. A long process went through asking the public what they thought about it, comments on the alternative analysis, public comments to the expert panel. Again, I understand we all don't agree with what that ultimate decision was, but I think it's unfair to say that there wasn't a process to come up with this point. Now, again, from where I stand, we're at that point, we've gone through that, there, there has been this decision made, putting the question out to the voters. Yes, that is the choice you're left with, but it's come after years of analysis and decision making on that. I, I know Jim before, no, I, the thing is, he came up here and twisted it around again. The thing is that this was the city council voted eight to zero and they opened the question up again. And they opened the question to us. And they come out here and give us one more sales job with our taxpayer money without giving the other people who have an alternative a chance to tell you what else you would get if you don't vote for steel rail. Okay, I, no, I'm gonna give you a chance. I am gonna give you a chance. This man has been waiting patiently to ask his questions. I'm gonna give him his turn. 
of them will really love because I don't know. But I'm gonna, out of fairness, you guys have been waiting patiently. Here's this question. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, my name is Scott Belford. I serve on the Evan Neighborhood Board, Traffic and Transportation Chair. I'm Po CAC Rep. And uh, I'm grateful to the city uh, for being here. I've got a follow up question regarding one of these uh, panels. I know you can't get an answer to me tonight. Uh, there's a, uh, a dotted potential spur that runs through Kalayanala and a little close to this community. And obviously, when anyone in this room or on camera sees this, it's quite compelling. Perhaps in some future meeting, you could give us some idea of uh, the cost and the funding mechanism for that be a reality versus uh, the color panel. Um, Bombardier, a uh, competing vendor, has a rubber tire technology that's used on a fixed steel guideway in Mexico City. And at some point, I would just want to know why that was never part of the consideration. I asked the Bombardier rep during one of the city council hearings, which is a thought. It's in use in Mexico City. It's on a steel fixed guideway. Is there someone who can answer the... The first question is, where's the funding going to come from to build the Kalailoa extension and how much is it going to cost? Okay, so we'll get that to you. Second question is, why did we not consider the rubber tire system that Bombardier uses in Mexico? Mexico City. You know, in, in terms of the technologies that the technology panel looked at, uh, they definitely looked at rubber tire technologies, uh, including the types that are used in Mexico City, which is also the same as in Montreal and, and some of the lines in Paris. Uh, so, you know, that, that was looked at in, in great detail by the, uh, by the panel. Um, and, and frankly, it's a similar type of technology has been considered here previously back in the 89, 90 uh, time frame. Uh, one of the proposers was a, a, a essentially a rubber tire fixed guideway system, also from Japan. Um, and you know, the technology panel's decision uh, regarding rubber tire technologies was probably the, the, the major issue with them was that they are. Uh, essentially a proprietary technology that there's a single manufacturer of them. And so you have uh, less competition in, uh, initially and, and certainly in, any, in seeking additional vehicles. Just the other round, again, just so what people understand the process that was gone through. We had um, an, an RFI, I think it was what it was called, a request for information from vendors who wanted to provide the city with a rail system. And they were able to come in and they could provide information about any system they wanted. And the, the Phillies bus system came in, steel wheel came in, rubber tire came in. There's companies like Bombardier that was mentioned, Alstrom, uh, Siemens, who all three of them have multiple technology. They do steel on steel, they also do rubber tire. I know Bombardier has also done a back lift system. And we asked them, why have you suggested to us to do a steel system as opposed to a rubber tire system or a, um, a magnet or anything else. And the response that came from all of them as they sat at the table, this was again during the public hearing, was that we looked at what your needs were, what the capacities and speeds were for the system that you were looking at. And a steel wheel system was what made sense. They said, we've had experience with all of these technologies. We know their capacities, we know their costs. This is what we would recommend if we were doing the system. So. I'm not saying that was the ultimate answer, but that information was also factored in and coming from those vendors uh, into that technology decision. Mr. Belfort's got one more question. She, ha, do you have to stay up here? Is there anyone we can, real quick, and then, because there's a lot in the it is just another suggestion. I don't expect you to have an answer tonight. But with respect to reaching out to the other community and driving to your uh, transit-oriented developments to park for the uh, for the mass transit, some estimate of the capacity, parking capacity, so that those of us here can mull over the logistics of the drive. Right now. And I don't, no, I don't expect you to have that number tonight, but that might be in future presentations. If you can leave your contact information. Or 
this lady has not asked Rene, I promise I'm not going to forget you. We're not going to go home until you get your question and you get your comment. I'll come as far as I can. This is it. Sorry. Oh, wait a minute. I can come to you. Thank you very much. I apologize. Um, the bog has my lungs. C.C. Curry. In winding up briefly the points that were key that were touched on, Jim Dunn brought up uh, marriage of trains. Todd's talked a lot about process, and Scott just brought up the Kalainoa Spur. We try to meet through the UMPO process, through the individual process, through every process that there was to offer an alternate technology for the Kalanoa Spur that was a marriage of trains, Jim. It was the solar trains that they have in India for that portion of the spur, which could coincide with the old railroad track for the Kalanoa Spur. It was never heard of. It, it was just squashed. And we submitted it through every process that there was. And we were never told why it was never considered. Any comment, Jim? You're not familiar with what she's talking about? We'll try to see if we can get back to that. Okay. Okay, <laughs> Since the mic is right here. This is a follow-up question for our council member poll. Question is so long. Question is anymore. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> but my follow-up question is, should the steel on steel um, um, question on the ballot fold steel on steel down, then what would be the next step? I mean, the traffic is nuts. We need a rail of some kind. So what would be the next step? And it would be nice to include Eva. My belief, and this is personal belief, is that if the, if the vote goes down, it is, I would say, highly unlikely that we are going to have a rail system problem. And the reason I say that is, the only way to fund this project, whether it's a steel on steel or a maglev or a steel wheel or even hot lanes, is to get federal money. This nearly billion dollars of federal money is the only way that we are going to be able to afford to create this system. And in talking with the FDA, go up and meet with Emmanuel Lee up in D.C. If the public opinion vote is no to this question, I, don't, I do not get personally believe that they will fund Honolulu with a mass transit project. FTA's, FTA's job, as they, they tell me, is that they need to find the best projects nationwide and make the recommendation to Congress as to which ones to fund. That is their job. And their, their success is in having successful projects. I do not believe that they will recommend to Congress funding nearly a billion dollars to a project that does not have a public support. And, and they're going to take this vote. And if it, if it doesn't pass, they're going to say, as much as we can explain away that, well, this was a steel question, not a real question, they're going to take this to say there is no public support for this project. And I tell you, it's going to be very difficult to get them over that hump to then recommend to Congress to fund Honolulu with a billion dollars at that point. And again, you've got to realize they don't have endless pots of money. There is competition for this money all over the place, all over the nation. And we have positioned ourselves to be able to, for FDA to be telling me when I'm sitting with them that we think this is a good project. You guys are on the right track. We're willing to, to recommend this amount. And I know there's been comments from Governor Cayetano recently about there's no guarantee. Yes, there's no guarantee. But the FTA support for this project, and I've, again, they've said it to me, they've said it when I sat in the meeting with the mayor and them, that they believe this is a good project, they, they are ready to recommend to Congress. And so again, we can try. If the vote is no, we can try for a different type of system. We can try for Hopkins. I just don't see where that funding is going to come from. That's that's the reality. And when you talk about hot lanes, as the state statute is set out right now, we cannot use the general excise tax money for hot lanes, any type of vehicle road system. And so we're not going to have that money either. Um, again, so there, there's ways to try to restart it by changing the state statute, by getting FTA back on board. But 
again, I see the, the, the reality, if this vote goes down, is, is that's what it's going to be. You know? I'll, I'll tell you, the, and this is to the claim that there's a system that can do the same thing for half the cost. There is. Okay, and I know, I know that's people's opinion. I'll, I'll tell you. No, and it's, it's not an opinion. Well, it is because I'll tell you, if there were really that reality, I don't, you know, you may not trust government. You may be skeptical about government. I don't think anyone's going to pass up a system that would do the same thing for half the cost. I know I would. And like I said, I've spent now almost four years looking at this stuff. And I've, I've met with Phileas individually and sat down with them to understand what their system does. I'd love to believe it, but I just, like I said, no one is going to be at a point where they can, where there is the reality of a system that can do the same thing from a capacity standpoint and have to cost and have an entire city say, we're not even going to look at it, and, or that we've looked at it, and we're not going to do it. So I understand there's different opinions. That's my opinion, so I just wanted to address that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, last comment. Uh, I just want to hit on Jim viewers' uh, comments. And I feel that uh, Evo Beach is the greatest loser. Uh, they come over here and they, they want to se sell us their, their project. Um, at the onset, onset of this project, we have never, Evo Beach has never been involved in a dialogue, discussion, or discourse as to what avenue or what uh, uh, proposal that we should accept. Uh, they came back, they came down and presented uh, the rubber, rubber on concrete, and I think it was very advantageous to the, the people of Ever Beach. Ever Beach has nothing. They have nothing at all, and they want to come down here and sell us this. It's not going to even affect us. So people, when it comes down on November the 4th, you can very well uh, think in your mind that uh, this, is, this is a project that's not going to benefit you. So, you know, uh, uh, they might try to sell this to you, but uh, I think it's going to go down. So, and I, I, I kind of chastise the, the, our elected officials by not presenting the alternatives for transit to the people of Evo Beach, and I think we're the greatest losers. Thank you. I know that it's 8 o'clock and we're to time. I want to thank all of you for coming out here. I realize it's a work night and you have and you have a, and everybody's got to get up early and go to work tomorrow. We do have your elected officials here who want to speak to you, but for those of you who are leaving, thanks for joining us. There's a couple more people who have a few more things to say to you. Just briefly, thank you everyone for coming out. Obviously, this is a controversial issue, but many of us in this community uh, disagree with the last gentleman and what he said. If you look at North South Road and Fort Weaver Road widening, there's over $200 million of tax dollars appropriated for our district just for those two road projects. We're working very hard to get a ferry in this area, possibly at um, Ocean Point or on the Iroquois Point. That's another transit solution. And ultimately, this project will benefit West Kawahu. When we become built out, with the shopping centers, the malls, the courthouses, the government buildings, UH West Oahu, and yes, the future growth of this island, which is for our children and our grandchildren. We're talking about a plan that's going to be 50 years and beyond. And these transit stations are, depending on where you live, anywhere from one mile to five miles from Ever Beach. This is a project where they're going to pay for it throughout the whole island. Waimanalo, Waianae, Wailua. Everyone's paying for it. And the tourists are paying a significant amount. But the direct beneficiaries will be West Oahu and Thank you, sir. Thank you. I'm Kirk Caldwell, the Majority Leader for the State House. And I came up because I thought it was really important to watch this presentation, which is the first of a series. And for me, I, I'm a little disappointed when I hear people get upset about what's happening tonight because I look at it as community outreach. We have Alicia Dow and her whole team 
all of these panels out here took so much work and effort to provide information to all of you, to get more educated on this decision that you're going to be making on November 4th. And to the extent you feel you haven't been heard or you haven't gotten the answers after reading all of these things, I'd encourage you to contact Elisa and she will get you the answers that you need. It really is about getting the information out to, to you. Um, before I conclude, I did want to emphasize one thing that your council member Tata Poe mentioned, and that's the billion dollars worth of money that you're hearing a lot of people throw around. Remember back in 1992 after the first Gulf War, we saw our economy drop very, very low. It stayed low until almost 2001. We started to climb out right before 9-11. We lived through a decade of recession. And at that point in 92, when the rail project died by a single vote, there was almost $700 million that had been committed to the rail project. And if you talk to Congressman Neil Abercrombie, he will go nuts every time he talks about this because that $700 million left our state and went to mainland municipalities for rail systems. And he said when he showed up in D.C. after the vote, all these guys came up to him and shook his hand and said, thank you, Congressman Abercrombie, for giving money to my city. It would have been money for the city and county of Honolulu to build a rail project, to create jobs, to make a difference in terms of how low and how steep the decline was. We face a similar situation today, only I think it's going to be a longer in duration and steeper, this economic upheaval we're going through. Once again, we have a chance to get federal funds. And these monies, if they don't come here, it's not like they drop into our pockets in terms of the federal tax return. It goes to mainland cities for their projects. And I hope we don't repeat that in the state. And that looking out of all of you and all of us up here, it is about jobs, very much so. It's also about bringing more sensible transportation alternatives to this island, to the Eva Plain, and for the rest of urban Hungary. So I want to thank you for coming up. I think it shows commitment on your behalf. You all work hard, you've got your kids, you've got dinner, you've got homework with the kids. It means you want to learn more. So absorb all the information you get and contact Elisa if you want more, and then vote intelligently on November 4th. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. We're going to get the boards up for a little bit more. If you want to go and talk to the project staff, thank you again for coming. We have more meetings uh, next week and later on this week, so if you want to come out that again, That was the guy who took away the gas cap. Thank <laughs> I don't know how they make these things so hard. <laughs> <laughs> I just, <laughs> but this might sound bad. Hey, Patrick, how you doing there, buddy? Right on. He was telling you, you the guy came home. Yeah. Yeah, yeah all right, all right. I just wanted to know who, who, who else? for and against. <laughs> no, 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 I just want to know who else got, what other company got $70 million to put up boards like this? It's the only one. What? Breaker off. Oh, and those nice little... Multi, multinational, multi-international company. Who did all the advertising? They're putting out the money, yeah, we give the money to put them up. And the bidder on presentations and everything. All the guys up there were for Breaker off. All in. So you know how to sell that project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. <laughs> we'll follow you guys there. Huh? Okay. But you're going to get another nice chance.